Um, we're next, uh, we've got um, Dr. Heather Lewis, um, who is a consultant uh, pathologist um, and also the deputy admissions tutor at Imperial College London. Um, she's also the um, foundation program training director at St. Mary's Hospital. Um, Dr. Lewis will be talking about um, applying to study med medicine at Imperial College and also the impact of COVID-19 on uh, medical, uh, medical training. Um, uh, once again, it's, uh, it's a privilege to have Dr. Heather Lewis here to talk to you today. Um, um, I'll, and I'll, you know, if you've got any questions, uh, again, put them in the uh, participant, put, it in, put them in the chat. You know, I'll be taking notes as we're going along. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Heather Lewis. Thank you. Hello, uh, just confirm you can hear me. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Dr. Khan. I'm really like, excited to speak to everybody today. Um, and thanks very much. And as he says, um, my name's Heather Lewis. I'm a consultant um, physician and hepatologist at Imperial and also one of the deputy admissions tutors for the medical school and also look after the foundation programme trainees. And I want to give a, an overview about applying to medicine. I want to talk about some of our widening participation initiatives, which we're really excited about and something we're really trying to improve on at the moment. And I also want to um, just touch briefly on how COVID has affected medical student training and also doctors during um, during the past year, because obviously it's had a huge impact on everything that we do. Um, hopefully by the time you are all um, starting as medical students in the next year or two will be having less of an impact but obviously we can't really predict exactly what's going to happen at the moment so i'm going to share my screen um i'm just going to take off there we go so and if there we go i'm just going to put this on to full screen and if, oh dr Carl, if you could just confirm it can you see that okay yes, yes we can perfect also. okay lovely so so as I said, we're going to talk about a brief overview. You want to talk a little bit about medicine. I suspect by now the fact that you're coming to this conference means you already know why you want to study medicine. Uh, but I just talk a little bit as someone who's been doing this job for a few years now about um, what we're looking for. Why, why do it? Why not do it? Part of the admissions process, because from outside it can seem rather oblique. Like, how do we choose people? Um, like I said, talk about widening participation. I've got a couple of slides on work experience, but I know we've just had an excellent talk on work experience. I'm um, covering everything and the same things. And also, how can you maximise your chances to get Get in um, and how have things been affected in the COVID-19 era. Um, so well, I suppose a really important thing to start with and particularly when you're thinking about and this is one of the things we think work experience is very important for is deciding why you don't want to do medicine. So why shouldn't you do medicine? Well um, it's not very glamorous, it's a long long training so you're talking five or six years, it's long and anti-social hours and hard work, Patients are often under a lot of stress and also um, can be under great emotional pressure at the time. Um, it can be really stressful and emotionally challenging for you, and it is a lot of responsibility. And most of the time, our job is not about curing. Um, it's about managing symptoms. It's about giving people the best quality of life that they can have um, during during the time that they have. And that is exceptionally rewarding and valuable. But but all these things, I think, are to remember, you know, um, medicine is an amazing career I absolutely love it still um, but it is also something it's really important to think carefully about whether it's the right thing for you um, because it's a lot of hard work to get there and if you then find that you're miserable doing it um, that's a lot of time that you've taken okay um, but reason why do medicine what, what, what's so exciting about it well it's really privileged um, your patients have tremendous trust in you and you have some of the highest trust ratings in the population it's a real vocation um, so you really feel like you're doing something you are um to, you know, your patients, the centre of everything that you're doing, you're, you're caring for them and looking after them. You have a really fascinating blend of basic and clinical science. So you're still learning all the time. And so every day I learn new things still. Um, it's incredible. You're working with people and caring for them. Um, it's international. We have a huge amount of variety. Um, in your job with a wide range of career opportunities. So whether you are fascinated by radiology, um, like pathology, like science, whether you want to be in a and E sort of seeing much more acute things all the time. There's something for everybody. Um, there's lifelong learning, as I said, like you're learning all the time and you have good, good job security. And also it's well paid as well. So, you know, it has a lot of benefits from that perspective. So, so there's a huge amount of things. Um, you will have your own reasons for it. One of the things we're really looking for when people are coming into medicine is to to see that you really understand um, why you want to do medicine, that you understand what medicine really, really means. Um, really means to you. Of course, you can look at uh, lots of different alternatives to medicine. There are other things that you can do. So 
if you're thinking about this, you think, well, perhaps it's not for me. You can go into research, uh, biomedical sciences. Um, there are loads of other healthcare professions, things like dentistry, podiatry, nursing, physiotherapy, uh, or you can go into medical journalism management. Um, it's really useful when you come to your interview to have quite a clear idea as to why you think you would like to enter medicine be, to be a doctor rather than, for instance, be a physiotherapist or a nurse, because it is a sort of question that you will often get asked. Um, and what we're looking for is that you have a really clear idea of what medicine involves for you why you want that. I'm just going to go a little overview of medical education and training in the UK. Um, so the undergraduate and graduate programmes, um, the basic qualifications, so it can be MBBS or your MBCHB. Then you go into a two year foundation programme. They are recruited to nationally, um, so foundation year one and two. And at the end of foundation year one, you get full registration with the General Medical Council. You will then normally start going into more specialist training. Um, and so you can either go and say, for instance, call medical training, call specialist training, go into general practice training uh, at that point, obstetrics and gynaecology, and then you'll become a qualified consultant or general practitioner. Um, there are a huge amount of different career options. I'm sure that you, or you may know some of these things about this, but there's general practice, um, you can be in hospitals, you can go into pathology, radiology, academic medicine, huge amounts of things in terms of research and education. You could become an army physician uh, or surgeon, or you can work in industrial research and drug development, or you can work within administration, work in the World Health Organization or, or the NHS. The, our current chief executive is a professor of gastroenterology um, and has been a clinician for his entire career until he took the job on the last couple of years. So, um, so for people who are really interested in management, that's something that they can do. And oh, there's lots of other things. So when we are looking at um, applicants for medicine, what we want to see is that you have the skills that a doctor needs and that you understand what they are. Um, and a, a lot of these are, so you do need to have a certain level of academic ability to do medicine because it is quite a challenging course. Um, there's a lot to know. But really, we're looking at those fundamental um, qualities, and that is about listening. So will you listen to patients, respect their views and rights, so you're honest and trustworthy? Can you work effectively with all healthcare professionals? Because your entire career, whatever aspect you go into, you're going to be working as part of teams, and it's vitally important for you giving good care to your patients that you work well within the team. You can act with competence, compassion, their responsibility and integrity, and that you're not judgmental about people, um, but you understand why people are are where they are and in that particular thing because you'll see people in a lot of suffering and distress and sometimes people will not always act in the best ways in those scenarios but it's not um it's not for us to judge them it's for us to care for them and to and to help them when they're at very difficult times we have this um other nice side and i think this is something to really think about when you're applying to medical school again is about what do we see as the ultimate good doctor um what what sort of qualities are there and how can you show that you have these qualities basically when you're applying for medicine you know some of these qualities that are things that we can learn and some of the things that come to us more naturally um but you know you do have to be a good decision maker you have to be able to take that knowledge and apply it in real life so it's like a little detective story with every patient you know i should particularly dr Carr say in general practice because you see such a wide variety of things um it's incredible um, you need to be technically competent you've got to be a really good team Team worker, organised, empathetic, have excellent communication skills, have really high integrity. You need to keep calm under pressure. So when things become very difficult, you know, are you going to be able to carry on, be professional? And you need to be a problem solver and a lifelong learner. And what we'd like to see when you're coming for interviews is you pulling out all of these different things um, for us to show us that you have the, the skills and these qualities. Uh, and we come into this and this is really, really important. Be humble. So, you know, um, I've been a consultant for about six or seven years now, but I still have to say I don't know, you know, um, to things. And I think it's really good for us to role model that. Nobody can know absolutely everything. And we have to ask colleagues for information about things. And, you know, we want to be able to show, well, if you're not sure about something, you go and ask other people, how do you find out that information and how do you get the absolute best for your for your patients? I'm going to give a very brief overview of the types of medical courses. I'm sure you've looked into a lot of this already, but you can do a five year course, um, which will normally have two years of sort of um, preclinical training and three years more clinical training, a six year course where you have an intercalated BSc, or you can have a four year a fast track graduate entry um, program. Um, not all medical schools will do this. Some Medical schools will offer integrated PhD programmes. We do for um, people who do really, really well in their intercalated BSc. So um, we do have the intercalated BSc programme. And sometimes you can also go overseas. Obviously, there are things to think about for you when you're choosing a course in a medical school that are really personal to you. 
different places will suit different people. So think about what are the entry requirements? Would you rather be in a big city or rural? How much will it cost to live there? Are there bursaries available? Um, is there much dist is it close to your home? Um, um, what about accommodation costs? Um, is a university prestigious? Does this really matter? Ultimately, everyone ends up with the same degree um, and the same training and also integrated degree options and also your style of learning. So do you prefer a problem based case solving learning or something more um, formalized where it's more lecture based learning? Um, different things will be offered by different places. Uh, why do we think you should come to Imperial? Obviously, I really like it. We're very highly ranked in the universities. Most of our graduates will get their first choice of foundation post. We have a lot of clubs and societies who have a really, really good um, social life for our students. And also we are located in, in West London, so it's an incredible place to live and study. It is expensive, but we do have bursaries um, for people, depending on household income. We have some of the most generous bursaries, actually, because we really would like to attract people. You may find it more difficult to afford that. Um, we have about 17 different choices to do your intercalated BSc in the programme. Um, we have incredible academic links with Imperial College um, and we're an academic health science centre. So you have a huge amount of really internationally renowned researchers who will be teaching you that you can do BSc things with. You have very early clinical exposure from the very first term, very good pastoral care, strong student body and world leading faculty. So I think there's lots of reasons uh, to think about coming to us. Um, in terms of the admissions process, I'm going to briefly overview that so you, you have a, an idea of how, how things work. This is for Imperial. All the um, universities will be slightly different, but for us, we use the BMAT um, as the first cutoff. So everyone who applies for Imperial has to undergo the BMAT test um, and you need to achieve the minimum cutoff there to get through to the next stage, which is to have your UCAS application form personal statement reviewed. Um, and that also includes your predicted grades. And then if you do not have the predicted grades that we require that that point, um, you would come out of the application process. If you get the BMAT scores required and you have the predicted grades required and your personal statement um, has all of the qualities that we want, then we would invite you to interview. Um, and we usually invite approximately a thousand people a year for interview for about 350 places. Um, and most people who come to interview will end up getting an offer. So the majority of people will. Um, very briefly, I am not an expert on the BMAT, but um, it's something to look into. I know there's also the UCAT. This essentially is looking at aptitude and skills and scientific knowledge. It has an excellent website that will tell you all about the different things that you need to do. it. And I think one tip from me is that um, if you're taking the BMAT, there's no evidence that paying for expensive courses helps you to do better on that. There is good evidence. What helps you to do well on the BMAT is doing timed papers um, under exam conditions. So practicing lots and lots of timed papers because actually it's it's doing it within the time period. Um, that's the difficult thing from, from this perspective. So that really helps. Um, and for us and for other, some other universities, getting that high cutoff is really, really important. Um, we... We have different cutoff scores in each section, but we always have a minimum. And to for widening participation candidates, we um, give contextual offers. So there's a lower BMAT cutoff score from that. Um, and the required minimum scores will vary, will vary each year. And I'll go a little bit more into the widening participation just in a moment. So these were the scores that we were looking for for 2020 entry to come in. The overseas scores are a bit higher. We have a lot less places for overseas students. So we have about 20 odd um, places a year for overseas students um, and home in EU. And the home in EU is changing at the moment because of the because of Brexit. So um, unfortunately for the EU students, they, they would now come into the overseas category. Um, so. So. Apply for UCAS, you need to apply obviously in mid-October. In terms of the academic qualifications that we would ask for, no specific GCSE requirements except having the GCSE grade six. And you need three subjects at A-level or the International Baccalaureate. Um, and we would normally want predicted grades of at least th three A's. Um, usually we'll offer on an A star and two A's. Um, and the R International Baccalaureate sort of six, six, six. Um, we need biology and chemistry as well. Um, your academic reference and a personal statement. Um, in your personal statement, as I was saying, the things we're looking for is understanding why you want to do medicine, you personally, okay, not um, not what you think we might want to hear, but you know, what what does it mean to you? Do you really understand what it involves? Um, Understanding what it actually involves, and particularly the challenges of medicine, are really, really important. So bring that out in your statement and your interview, um, because we want to know this is something you're going to do for the rest of your life, that you understand what the challenges might be and how you'll face those challenges um, and how you might cope with them. So we 
will look really, really highly on people who say, well, I may find it really stressful, say, I don't know, whatever it is, seeing someone uh, dying or if families are upset. And but this is what I would do to to cope with that, because it shows a real understanding. Uh, look at your breadth of experience. So I know um, we're just talking about um, the work experience and, and everything and basically saying it doesn't have to be medical. What we want to see is you understand what it's like to be in a responsible role. What's it like to care for people? What is it like to lead people? So any kind of experience that you have in terms of community experiences, charities, doing mentoring work um, or other interests in sports that you can say teamwork or music, if you, uh, any of these things are really, really important. Um, also, don't repeat the information and, um, and everything you put in your um, statement, you should be prepared to discuss it into. We're just really interested in who you are um, as an individual person. Um, when we're looking at people uh, becoming doctors um, and also things, we, we want to highlight the values of the NHS constitution. So, um, you know, it's improving lives, giving respect and dignity that everyone counts. And, and this is what we're looking for. Commitment to quality of care, working together for patients and also compassion. So will you bring all of these qualities to us? Um, these are our typical offers for 2021 entry. Um, so normally A star AA in biology and chemistry and the IB would normally be a 39 um, and also Cambridge for you. We wouldn't usually accept general studies or critical thinking. I um, wanted to talk a little bit in terms of like coming in about widening participation to medicine. So why is it important that we do that? Well, um, medicine has a problem at the moment in terms of attracting people from um, candidates from lower socioeconomic groups. And I think, and I, I personally think that's a real problem. So I come from a, a, a widening partition patient type background myself, so does our head of admissions at Imperial. And it's something we're really passionate about. And my colleague, um, Professor Murphy, is doing a lot of work, work on this. But basically, as you can see here, that in medicine, veterinary science, so the polar three is looking at um, participation in higher education neighbourhoods. And, and what that's showing is that medicine and dentistry and veterinary science have very low um, entries um, from people in these low participation and the NSSEC classes, that's looking at the socioeconomic classes. Um, and these are ones that would be more in terms of um, semi-employed or perhaps never employed jobs. And again, we have very low entry requirement for them. And actually, it's really important that as public servants and, and carers and professionals, we reflect the society that we come from um, and that that we have people who come from all aspects of our society, not just people who come from the better off backgrounds. So it's something which is really, really important to us. Um, how, how do we try and help in this sort of scenario? Well, we use something called contextual data. So to classify people as widening participation or not. And basically that looks at things like, do you come from a care background? What's your educational background and the, the background of your school? So have many people gone into medicine and other things from there? And also your postcodes. So it's, it's a sort of broad brush looking at areas of deprivation. Um, um, fortunately, you can't actually tell whether you would classify with these criteria until you actually apply. But if you think that you might um, fit into these criteria, then definitely, definitely apply because it does mean that the offers would be lower. And it, it might not sound like much, but we would normally give an, a AAA offer rather than A star AA. And that actually doubles the number of people who will get an offer in place. So it does make quite a significant difference. Um, so, yeah, we invite people to enjoy on the basis of grades and BMAT scores and the BMAT score slightly lower for the contextual and um, providing participation. Um, and people who meet the minimum score would be invited to interview. And we find that once people get to interview, a very similar number of widening participation candidates and other candidates will, will get through that process at the time. So um, we also offer some things. So my colleague is saying Professor Murphy does this excellent Pathways to Medicine course. So that used to recruit two years um, prior to application, but now recruits in year 12. And basically that involves things like a summer school, some e-mentoring. Um, you have um, online courses as well. You have advice about interviews and other things to try to help people prepare for coming into medicine. And the medical schools council also just summer schools, which involve coming to see medical students, having exposure to what's happening. And, and if you get onto those courses, you will automatically um, qualify for the the contextual offer, so the slightly lower offer. The other thing that we have is we do have quite a generous bursary for applicants. So um, I'm not sure how well it's it's actually projecting there but depending on your household income you can get support um, for cost of living which can really help when you're in London uh, obviously it's very expensive um, to to live in London so um, just other things about applying so troubleshoot so we would say to apply early don't apply too young um, and let us know early if there's problems um, 
well, how can you maximize your chance of getting a place? So what we say is work hard, you've got to get the grades. So, you know, it's really, really, if you don't get the grades, you, you won't get into any, any of the medical schools, unfortunately. It's really, really important. Also look at whether you need to do things like the BMAT or the UCAT. Um, and take things back. Now, I know you've just had a really excellent talk on work experience, so I'm not going to spend um, very much time dwelling on this. I think I'm actually probably reiterating a lot of the things, but we basically consider work experience to be any kind of activity that helps you understand what a career in medicine involves. And it obviously has been much more difficult in the time of COVID. So people before would perhaps try to get one or two weeks experience in hospital, maybe GP setting, shadowing a doctor, um, but actually any voluntary or paid work interacting with the public or in a caring role helps. Anything where you can show I have shown leadership, I've worked in a team, I have been in a caring role, I understand what it's like to work in a stressful situation, it's really important to us. That's, um, you know, really important. There are a number, um, as I already said, about online courses such as the Brighton and Sussex Medical Schools and Observe GP, and you can get brilliant insight in books and TV programmes, particularly these documentaries um, at the moment, so for things like 24 Hours in A&E, um, and I saw that on the chat there was lots and lots of different books being recommended, and they do give you a really good insight one of our interviewers said the best answer they ever had about why someone sort of like what someone understood about medicine the person actually was talking about a tv program they'd watched and when they started everyone thought oh gosh not sure about you know watching tv but the, the depth of understanding they showed of what it was like to be a doctor the stresses and other things they were really blown away by the answer so it really is what you take out from it what's your understanding not exactly what you've done um I think this is always said, but how to get the best out of the work experience. Think of just plan it. Think about what you want to get out of it. Work hard and be punctual and polite. If you can take advantage of all opportunities, doing the administration, taking the notes and reflect on your experience. And just think about how you'll talk about this in your interview. Think about what you're getting from it at the time. Um, it's really important as doctors for us to be reflective practitioners. It's really helpful for us to um, if you start getting those skills really, really early on in your career. Um, so, and like I said before, this is what we want you to understand from work experience, that what it's like to work in a responsible caring role and what the reality of working as a doctor really involves. Um, just a couple of things about the interview. So basically the purpose of everything that you're doing is to get to the interview and you will normally be offered a conditional place um, at that medical school once you've got to interview. We do multiple mini interviews um, and it sounds like from the chat, some of you had already experienced these. And what we're looking for in those is the kind of non-academic skills that you're, you're needing. So your motivation to study medicine, what's your understanding of medicine as a career, empathy, teamwork and leadership, resilience, communication. Um, what's your maturity of approach? How do you approach things? And how will you contribute to medical school life in the community? What will you bring to us? And also to make sure that your values align to the NHS constitution. So in terms of predicting um, and preparing for the interview, focus on these different areas and understand, you know, what does it mean um, to be empathetic? How, ca how can you show you've been empathetic? Te teamwork and leadership, can you give examples of when you worked in a team, when you've been a leader? Can you under explain exactly what we mean by teamwork and leadership? Uh, can you show sort of areas of resilience um, and communication? So yeah, reread your statement beforehand and just make sure you're ready to discuss everything. Um, and in the interview, just demonstrate energy, that positive approach, be really honest and open, able to take on others' ideas, but also ready to offer your views and be able to talk about things. Um, I've got, uh, I think, a couple of minutes later. So we'll just talk a little bit about medical education in the COVID times. And there's actually quite an interesting article written by one of our final year medical students regarding this. Um, it was really challenging, um, obviously, for all healthcare professionals, very difficult for our medical students. So. Um, they were unable to get the same vocational exposure in the clinical setting they've had. Um, it's really difficult to replace that remotely. The campuses were locked down and there was a, a lot of concern about the risk of COVID and, and students coming onto the ward initially in the hospital placements. Um, the content delivery, suddenly everything had to be moved, changed online to use lecture theatres. The assessments were very difficult, so OSCEs had to be postponed. And normally people would sit in a huge hall to um, do written exams and these suddenly all had to be changed. The hospital placements were postponed. Um, and there's also concern about well-being for students. So one of our students I was speaking to said it was very difficult actually being on the wards and seeing patients dying of COVID, particularly when this may reiterate experience in your own family. So when students have got had had their own relatives who were unwell or very sadly who died from COVID and then that the shock of seeing other people with that and the trauma that that 
that brings. It's very, very difficult. Um, so there was a lot of adaption to teaching. So everything moved to online via Zoom and Teams and actually got really positive feedback from students and a higher attendance. So, of course, there can be technical difficulties. People can get distracted and try and do the same things. And some some staff weren't able to use things. We also had on access to online banks of patient interviews and interactive cases. And one of our surgeons used these amazing HoloLens specialty adapted headsets to give students that first person view of the patient examinations. Um, so, so students were able to sit in a different room to watch what they were doing. And also there's lots of telemedicine that has been used. So there's loads of really innovative things that were actually brought in. In terms of assessments, the OSCEs were postponed and now there'll be a number of remote stations um, and actually will include things like online history and examination stations. So you'll have to listen to reading sounds and heart murmurs. And also Imperial College used completely remote online medical student examinations using this open book examination, which actually had very positive feedback from the students. It really reduced anxiety and mirrored sort of real clinical practice. Um, so open book meant that you could look up things, say, for instance, like what's the normal range for reticular site count. Um, but you couldn't look at a lot. You still had to use your clinical synthesis and um, everything else. Very near finished. It also, we found that like our students were redeployed to do things like um, healthcare assistance and IT. Most of those found that incredibly valuable. They felt that they were helping out. They saw the power of teamwork. Um, it nurtured students' persistence and resilience, their ability to suddenly adapt. And our final year students acted as interim FY1s last April, and they found that hugely beneficial for preparing for FY1 and now adapted into the final year curriculum. Um, so we've actually brought that in as a very specific foundation assistance ship where, where students can use that. So, so there's a huge amount of um, positive that came out of it, although it was very challenging for everyone. Um, that is the end of my talk. Sorry, I'm a minute over, started a, a little bit late. Um, but I don't know if there were any questions at all, if we have time for that or not. Um, yeah, I think uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Lewis, for a, an excellent talk. Um, the, the, the are questions, but I think you answered them um, ah. <laughs> almost okay. straight away after they were in one of the future slides. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the questions were based on uh, on, on bursaries and, and work experience and, and, and interviews. Um, so, so I think you've covered the vast majority of things that, that the students have been asking. Oh, good. Um, yeah, just 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 out of uh, interest, um, um, clinical placements. I think Dr. Lewis touched on um, yes. the impact of COVID in hospital. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, we we you know me and Dr. Mann, we have a practice in East Lancashire that has medical students. Yes. Um, and and so the, the, yeah, there has been a change. Students. We, we, what, what I think has happened in from from our practice is students that are shielding. So, for example, if students are high risk, um, you know, for example, if you've got medical issues, then you know, they they've been able to ring patients. Um, you know, so they still get clinical experience, but they they have been able to ring patients from home or remotely, uh, yes. and patients that are med perhaps medically, uh, you yes. know, more more kind of safe. Um, to deal with potential COVID, a COVID environment, are allowed to come into the practice. Um, you've had to wear full PPE, full personal protective equipment. Um, we've set up a separate zones in the surgery where patients are, you know, isolated from each other. You know, uh, you know and, this, and, and the, you know, the rooms have to be disinfected between each patient. And yes, so the, the, the thing is, medicine's a very hands-on, and you know, you can never get away from the clinical contact. Um, even as a GP, although we're ringing vast majority of patients over the phone, there's still every day, you know, 30% of patients I'm bringing into surgery because I have to examine them. Um, yeah. It's just one yeah. of the things that you have to accept that in medicine, you are going to be exposed to risk uh, of infection. Um, and all you can do is try and minimize the risk. Um, yeah. in, in some of the courses, you can probably get away. And, I, and I've come across some medical schools that, I'm, that are kind of doing a whole year online virtually to start off with, yeah. but there's no getting away. You need clinical experience. So at some point in your medical school career, you're going to have to see uh, patients and you're going to have to see them you know, in the middle of a, a pandemic, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think, you know, what it's about is about, um, it's about protecting students. So initially students weren't allowed on, but we've had students in the recent surge with us the entire time on the wards and they've really appreciated the experience. And of course they've had exactly the same PPE as we've had um, mm. when we're seeing things. I think it has infected, um, as you're saying, Ran, like um, the ability, because we do a lot of clinics from on the phone as well, that's difficult for students to learn so much for listening, but also picking up the, 
the skills of doing that, which we all need nowadays, is actually a really valuable part of your training as well. So, you know, you should never be exposed to risk as um, students. So I think it's one of those things where despite the challenges, there's been an awful lot of um, there's been an awful lot of benefits from it. Um, and I think someone was, I saw a couple of things here about what hepatology is. So, so it's liver, liver disease, basically, but we also do um, general medicine. So a bit of everything. Um, but my specialty is liver disease. And someone's asked about giving more weight mm -hmm. age, weight to more A levels taken or further mass. We, we don't give weight to more A levels or further mass. So you have to have biology and chemistry. Um, and we don't include general studies. But apart from that, um, it doesn't matter. So your third A, we just need the three the three A levels. So apart from that, it, it doesn't matter what it is. So I personally did history as well as um, chemistry and physics, and I did general studies. But I went to Sheffield. But you know, it, you don't have to have all sciences to get into medicine. You've just got to look at the schools, medical schools you want to go to, and make sure you have the the core subjects they want. Usually, that will include chemistry and biology. That's I think that's correct, isn't it? Most medical schools that want chemistry and biology. Okay. Okay. Um, we, we're still having lots and lots of questions, but I'm just wary of time. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Lewis, for an absolute excellent presentation. No uh, problem. Thank you so of, much. Thank lots you. And lots of Bye. positive feedback there. Um, uh, and again, th thanks, uh, you know, thanks for, for thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 -bye.